right. It's a particular cough. It's the cough without a cause, called the habit cough syndrome. Uh, keep that in mind. It doesn't have a cough. It doesn't have a cause. So when you see it, don't try to give them medication. They do not respond to any medication. Now, I've uh, collected a number of uh, videos that uh, parents have sent me. <coughs> and here's one. <coughs> a patient that, uh, being seen at Level Air Hospital in, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. And to show this happens all over the world. <coughs> the characteristic of this cough, as much as you hear that, and this can go on all day, once they're asleep, they are quiet. If someone is coughing all night, it is not the habit cough. Causes a lot of stress, not just for the patient, but for the whole family to live with that sound going on all day until they go to sleep. So here's one from uh, <coughs> Imagine living with someone that in your house and you're doing that all day. So this 11-year-old boy from Mumbai, interestingly it's the second episode for him, and history was he had had a similar episode lasting about four months, gradually resolved, and then he got a cold, got a viral respiratory infection, and it started again going on for three months at this time. First time the parents just lived with it. I think they got a, he got a lot of medication. Doesn't do any good. So they estimated, again, uh, hundreds of coughs going on all day. Again, no coughs. <coughs> So those are the two examples of the habit cough. And you can define the habit cough as a daily repetitive non-productive. It is typically non-productive. It's a dry cough, absent during sleep. And the absence during sleep is essentially a uh, synchronon. If they're, if they're uh, this is a characteristic of the habit cough. A honking or barking, like you heard, is uh, common, uh, but in fact, uh, the sounds really vary. Uh, now, the habit cough has been known in medical literature for a long time. Uh, I have some references uh, from the 17th century uh, that describe very nicely uh, the modern habit cough. Here's one that I like from the 19th century. Charles Crichton, a British physician, uh, described in his 1886 book, a habit cough, a reflex effect persisting after the cause is gone. So very often, typically, there is a cause that starts it. It's usually uh, a res minor respiratory infection, very often. And very often the parents will say, well, he had a bad cold and he was coughing. And then the cough changed and it became this dry, 
repetitive cough. So Dr. Creighton went on to state the treatment of this is to break the habit. Very insightful. Uh, because the uh, first one who actually showed how to break the habit, uh, unless Dr. Creighton did and doesn't say so, was a uh, doctor by the Bernard Berman who was an allergist in Boston. Smart guy. Over a five year period, he had six patients with coughs somewhat similar to what you heard. Fit all the characteristics of the habit cough. Ages were nine to 13 years. Three boys and three girls. He stated in this article, he stopped the cough by what he called the art of suggestion. He went into a little bit of detail what that is, but not specifically. Ergo, uh, the treatment since then that is successful is called suggestion therapy. He also considered the nomenclature of this because previous case reports had talked about it being psychogenic cough, which is very popular in some of the Chinese literature I've seen, uh, a tick cough. But he said the boys, uh, the, the boys and girls, the, the six patients, had no psychological reason. Uh, they were perfectly normal kids, except for the coughing. And he said it's obvious it's, they're not ticking, they're coughing. I mean, it sounds like a cough. Uh, in, uh, there is such a thing as a vocal tick, but these are not vocal. This is a cough. You heard it. <coughs> so because he was able to stop the cough by this art of suggestion, he felt habit cough was the most appropriate term. And that's the one that they still some people debate that, but it really fits best. And the reason it fits best is the psychologists talk about a habit disorder, which includes such things as thumb sucking, trichotillomania, a uh, variety of either uh, habit disorders that have the characteristic of repetitive unwanted behavior, it's involuntary. Uh, the girls with the trichotillomania just have this compulsion to keep pulling their hair out. <coughs> so it's involuntary, causes distress, functional impairment, and physical and social consequences. These are characteristics of the habit disorder, and I think clearly the habit cough falls into that category. And my first publication on this was in 1991. Uh, the index case that got us, uh, we had been routinely, I'd been routinely seeing uh, children with habit cough even before I first uh, at a faculty appointment at the University of Iowa. Uh, and it, just as it seemed logical to Bernie Berman, it seemed logical to a few other physicians, including me, that this isn't something you gave medication for. This is something that you use as a behavioral technique to get them to stop. So the index case was a 15-year-old girl uh, who had traveled uh, 100 miles down from uh, Chicago, northern Chicago suburb to Iowa City, where I was. And uh, as I had done repeatedly, and my colleagues also had done, had stopped the cough with 15 minutes of suggestion therapy. And I'll show you an example of suggestion therapy shortly. My fellow, Dr. Bokshin, asked, 
the first one he'd seen. And he said, that's impressive. Uh, parents were impressed also. It was what you would call a jaw dropper. Uh, the parents had put up with this 15-year-old girl coughing for months, and all of a sudden she stops from me talking with her. So Dr. Lakshin asked the logical question, is the fix permanent? And I did the next logical thing as a mentor. I told him, find out. <laughs> That's what you do. Uh, and so uh, he went through manually. This is before we had an electronic medical record. Uh, find uh, nine, went through ch just charts until he found nine cases. They were all six to seven years old. They were in the range of six to 17 years old. Median was 11. Uh, they were routinely contacted one week later. One had no symptoms. Eight had minor self-control symptoms. This means they would occasionally cough, but they, would, they knew how to stop it now. Uh, and he followed, was able to contact seven of them uh, years later, an average of two point over two years later. Uh, six of them had no symptoms at all. Uh, one had occasional symptoms that they self-controlled. So let me talk a little bit about the treatment of cough. And we described that in a large number of patients in uh, this publication. Uh, essentially, we look back over 20 years in our electric medical record uh, for the times we made the diagnosis. Uh, and uh, coughing was actually observed 85 times during the clinic. I actually, did it myself or one of my clinicians uh, saw it. And in 81 of 85, 95% essentially were cured. We were able to stop them with suggestion therapy. Uh, probably not exactly like Bernie Berman did, but a variation and other variations have probably been used by other physicians. And we taught something we called auto-suggestion, and we told them what we did here in the clinic, you can do yourself when you go for 10 or 15 minutes by the time, by a clock, and concentrate and do exactly what we did here in the clinic. Do it yourself. And they do it, not the parents. Parents aren't coughing, so we don't treat them. We're treating the child. Sometimes with the very young ones, the parents have to get involved. The, uh, let's talk about the epidemiology. How often does this happen? We averaged over about a 12-year period, nine per year. And a uh, nice publication came out from the Brompton Hospital here in London uh, over a six-year period. They also were averaging about nine per year. I think it's reasonable to make an estimate any major referral center is likely to have somewhere around nine per year. That means you're not seeing them every week in the clinic or every month in the clinic, but you're probably not going two months without seeing one. Gives you an idea of how often it is. The diagnosis is purely clinical. And the people at Brompton uh, use exactly the same criteria. Uh, no testing, there's no testing, it's really of any value. It's the presentation of this repetitive dry cough that is totally absent once they're asleep. What organic cause of cough causes that much coughing all day and yet once they're asleep, it's gone. I can't think of any that is characteristic of it. So the diagnosis is not made by any test. It's made purely by the clinical characteristics. That was what we were doing, and that's exactly what they were doing at the Brompton Hospital also, according to your publication. Mean age, both at the Brompton and at Iowa City, was 10 years, and both genders are there. Uh, <coughs> 
And as I said, the cough can continue, sometimes spontaneously improving, but sometimes not. Months, years, months and years even for some. In fact, at the University of Iowa, uh, we found 18% um, of what we saw had been going on for more than a year from the history we had from the parents. Secondary gain is not usually absent. It's, it's, it's usually absent. It's not there. Uh, the kids don't like it. They're not doing it to stay out of school. <laughs> Generally, they want to go back to school. And obviously, when you have a bunch of kids, there's going to be occasional psychopathology, but it's not real common, and it doesn't seem to be a characteristic of the disease itself. So until this particular case, in February of 2019, every case that I and colleagues had done had been with the patient in front of us. This was the first time I did it by remote process. The father called me, said his daughter was coughing, 12-year-old daughter was coughing for three months. Uh, and uh, he was 2,500 miles away from me. I was on the West Coast, he was on the East Coast. You did it over three minutes. <laughs> did it get a little bit easier that time? Mm -hmm. Still hard though, huh? Okay, we're gonna go for four minutes now. Yeah, okay. You're doing it. You're doing great. You went three minutes before you coughed. Mm -hmm. So I bet you can do four minutes too. The demonstration video, the whole one can be found. Because you're in your control. You're letting it control you. Um, or uh, on YouTube, this is on YouTube. Uh, and so you can find it. On the so this is what you have to be doing. You may have to do it for a while. Now, the father, uh, her father, took that video, placed it on YouTube, so it was accessible, it's accessible to everyone. And then we started getting something that was unexpected and unintended, and that is people would see the video and stop coughing. <laughs> <laughs> weird. It was absolutely weird. But... Uh, as I said, that wasn't what we attended, but we made that observation, published this paper for me. I'm going to show you uh, two, uh, segments of two emails I had. And here's one from uh, uh, Riley, who was seven years old. Uh, a few months back, she had a really bad cold, uh, which is a bad cough for a few weeks. The cold symptoms went away, except for that cough. There was no stop to it. Uh, she went on to say in this segment, uh, it was uh, finally decided to just pull up the video on YouTube and we sat there and watched it. It was very emotional for all of us. Riley was in tears. We all were. We hugged for a time. She said, I can hold the cough back and the coughing stopped. Mother well, said she hadn't heard any cough for four days. Here was one from an adult. 30-year-old who suffered a chronic cough for almost two years. In that time, he saw a lot of doctors, had a lot of medication, uh, none of which did any good, had medical procedures done, uh, all to no avail. He found the website and watched Bethany and me. Uh, Bethany is the name of the 12-year-old girl you just saw. Uh, he followed the procedure, saw the effects almost immediately. He said, I am truly amazed that such a simple procedure at no cost with no medication can be so effective. So these are just two emails that I've had out of hundreds. Uh, this map, the um, red dots are parents' emails that we got that the child had stopped coughing from watching the video. The blue dots are adults who said they saw the video 
in stock profit. Remarkable, amazing, but this is fact. So what's, what, what happens if they don't get suggestion therapy? Do we know? What's the natural history of this? Well, this is a ch one from Mayo Clinic. They had seen our first study, and so they went into their archives, uh, pulled out, uh, let's see, I don't know how many patients, uh, pulled out uh, about 60 of their patients, I think. And uh, the diagnosis had been made, uh, oh, these were old patients that had been there, they just called them uh, involuntary cough syndrome. Uh, so they did this follow-up of 62 patients for a meeting of the eight years. Ages, again, were an average of 10, just like we had at Brompton and at the University of Iowa, but a, sp a spread, 5 to 16, uh, similar to what we had. Mean cough duration before they made the diagnosis had been eight months before they went to Mayo Clinic. 75% had a spontaneous resolution. They eventually got better on their own, but the average was six months. And 25%, 16 of the patients, were still coughing six years later. So this is not a benign disorder that always go, it resolves. It stays on for a long time in many cases. And, may, and I have definitely seen adults who say they've had the symptoms since they were kids. Not often, but I've seen a few adults with that history. Uh, the Brompton uh, didn't use any specific therapy. They would explain what it was, and uh, they would counsel the patient. No specific suggestion therapy. They had 55 patients that they had diagnosed and reassured. Uh, they were able to follow 39 of them an average of 1.9 years, 20 resolved pretty quickly, some within a week, just by reassuring them that it was uh, a benign disorder. Uh, but uh, nine took one to six months to resolve, four took longer than six months to resolve and six had incomplete resolution, that is, they, didn't, they continued to cough. There is uh, some degree of physiologic explanation for this. Uh, there is generally a respiratory infection of some sort, often a very benign one. Uh, this was a study by, done by Richard Erdwin uh, who did, did bronchoscopies on a, the adult volunteers who had this chronic idiopathic cough, uh, no known cause. Uh, and he found, he reported that when he looked at the mucous membrane uh, under a microscope, he got segments of it, uh, it was a, uh, it, there was inflammation there. He hypothesized that the inflammation was from the coughing itself. Uh, a more recent, uh, publication and just uh, a couple of years ago in 2021 in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine uh, found increased nerve endings in that inflammation. So you're talking about neuropathic inflammation that both of these, Dr. Irwin and Dr. Shapiro, hypothesized it was caused by the coughing itself as they could see no other explanation and again, Dr. Irwin's was actually a controlled clinical trial. So, the inflammation, neuropathic inflammation, was caused by coughing, which is the feeling that the patients often describe as the cause of the cough. Essentially, you've got a vicious circle. Cough, it's caused by cough, which causes cough. Thing. Going back to Dr. Creighton's uh, comment in the 19th century, uh, the trick is to break that cycle. Okay, the principles of treatment by suggestion therapy 
is what all physicians should probably do, even for other things, must have confidence in success. Uh, focus the patient's attention on suppressing the cough. Explain the cough in a rational manner, in an age-appropriate manner. Obviously, you talk a little differently for a six-year-old than for a 16-year-old. Reinforce the brief success, as I did, as you saw me doing with Bethany. Emphasize that the patient is the one controlling the cough. To tell the patient, the kid, that the parents can't stop his cough, I can't stop his cough, but I can show him how to stop the cough, and they do. Uh, and again, even though I stop it, they need auto-suggestion to reinforce it when they're home. And uh, the wise old Yoda says, uh, You don't tell the patient, I'm going to try this. No, you never try it. You do it, or you don't do it. There is no try. You have to approach it confidently like you're going to succeed, and you have to get that confidence to the patient and to his parents. Very important. So the take-home message here is daily repetitive dry cough absence during sleep is a habit disorder. That's the habit cough syndrome. Uh, it's a daily troublesome cough in both children and adults. Uh, habit cough can last for months and years. It requires no medication. This is the worst thing you can do for them, is to try and treat every known cause of cough. They don't have every known cause of cough. They have a unique, very distinctive cough that differs from all others. But it does respond to a simple behavioral technique whether it's exactly what I use or what others might use, but the principle is the same. So, how the cough works by direct contact, by teleconference, and by proxy. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Weinberger. That's really interesting. And um, I just wonder if there's anyone in the room with any questions that you'd like to ask? Yeah, I and that I didn't add, I think every pediatric pulmonologist should know that as well as they know how to do bronchoscopy. <laughs> Different process, but I think everyone can do it using the principles that I've talked. So my question is that the classic teaching has always been that habit cup is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you have to investigate for everything else before you can confidently say that's habit cup. Because often when a patient comes in, they've already been tried, you know, anti-inflammatory inhalers, you know, salvitamols and other things, antibiotics. So would you suggest that you do that or do you just go straight to that? if you are happy and confident from the history. Was that a question? Or? Yes, that's a question. Mm -hmm. uh, that um, habit cough is often been, been told to be, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. It's so a, that is it's a diagnosis uh, by excluding other serious cause. Is this what you would recommend, that we exclude other serious cause first before we get there, that is a habit cough? Yeah, I'm not sure what the question is, go ahead. Yeah, the question is, would you investigate first before you say that this is how it comes? Would you try and exclude other things? Because the patient is already on treatments and things for that. If it fit the pattern, I mean, there might be an occasional case where there's confusing, occasionally, but not often. It's so typical. If you're wondering if it's asthma, you could give them a five-day course of prednisone and see if the cough goes away. That's easy. Uh, I, other than uh, routinely, we did spirometry. Uh, uh, because if the spirometry is normal, uh, chest x-ray is normal. The odds of them having some other disease that could have them coughing all day for weeks and months is so unlikely that it's not worth doing 
extensive evaluations. In other words, the diagnosis is very distinct, very different from all physical causes. There might be an occasional patient where there's a degree of confusion, but it would be very occasional. The typical habit cough is diagnosed clinically. That's a, they diagnosed them at Brompton Hospital exactly the same way we did in Iowa City. They said it was a distinctive thing. It was absent that once they were sleeping, totally different from any other physical cause of cough. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps we could put the, the, the answer the other way around. If you saw a child similar to a child that you've seen on the video, uh, would you feel compelled to have to do a bronchoscopy and a CT scan and a... No, not no not, clearly not. Yeah. Not if they were coughing and, like, and like, and a, the cough goes like away you saw in their them, demonstration to and totally go in at night. Yeah. I would not... Uh, I mean, I was always ready to do bronchoscopy uh, when a child had a cough that, that was unexplained. I mean, we, we published a, a, a first one in the U.S. on uh, protracted bacterial bronchitis uh, that had already been done by Dr. Annie Chang. Uh, so we're, we're, we're ready. But it shows if you see them doing like those two and you ask them, what about when they're sleeping? When they're sleeping, we never hear them cough. That's enough for me to not do a lot of physical things or trials of other medications. They don't work. Okay, we've seen enough. And uh, the doctors at Brompton seem to. I suppose my one. Along with that also. My one last question is do you think only doctors can do it? What about, you know, I'm just thinking you were saying every pulmonologist needs to know how to do that and a bronchoscopy, but surely the suggestion therapy could be done by another member of, uh, of the MDT uh, that, yes, that, because uh, it can be time consuming. With me. Yeah. yeah. Called me once I was left out of a city and she was so happy because, uh, you know, she said she did the same thing because she, she saw me do it. Yeah. And uh, I've had. Uh, fellows at, at teaching clinics that I go to, you know, also saying, uh, and uh, a doctor in Texas who had been treating these patients by some form of suggestion therapy, he said it's the pediatric pulmonologist's uh, nursemaid's injury. You know, <laughs> this radial head subluxation when you pull that and you click it, you, you cure it, but they look like the broken arm, you turn their arm and they stop. Uh, there aren't many things where you have instant cures, where you cure without medicine. This is one of them. Thank, thank, thank you very much. We'll probably have to end the session now, so you can go for lunch. Thank you. Thank you. That's interesting.